Welcome to Massive Late Fee. And now your hosts, Mark and Carol. Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to Massive Late Fee. It is May 27th, 28th, 28th, May 28th, 1994. What is wrong with you? <laughs> my name is Mark. With me as always is my girlfriend, Carol. How are you doing, Carol? Hey, what's up? We... We've had a good week here at Massive Late Fee. Uh, it's been Carol's birthday, so for the whole week, we are still we are still finishing up the celebrations, <laughs> as you may be able to hear. It's been awesome. I got Carol the box set of the first season of Nine Hundred Two One Zero. I'm so excited. So we will be bringing you some Nine Hundred Two One Zero from the beginning. I have never seen this show. Carol has. A few years ago yeah, when, when it, it first, first started. Out, yeah. So it'll be absolutely new to me. So, and uh, I think Carol is probably still remembering things. Yeah. It, it's it's interesting to see it again knowing what I know now. Mm. That is interesting. Yeah, it kind of gives it a different, you know, perspective. and. It's funny, it hasn't been that many years, but the amount of age. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's like... It's like they've all served in the presidency. <laughs> they look noticeably older. Well, I mean, imagine we're, we're going to look a lot different in like three years. I mean, it's just what happens at this age. I think I'll probably look exactly the same. Mm. <laughs> Keep telling yourself that. Anyway, so news this week. First of all, sad news for Arsenio Hall. Used to be the... The next hot thing in late nights, back when it was just Johnny Carson doing late <laughs> night, basically, and Jay Leno was his permanent guest host, and David Letterman was appearing after him, and that was all late night was, unless you were into news and then you watched Nightline, which obviously you can still do. Right. But he was the big thing. There were obviously some failed people before him. Merv Griffin famously failed at his talk show. And I think Pat Sajak had a late night talk show as well. And there was, you know, some other ones. But Arsenio looked to be the big one that was going to break out. And obviously that has not happened because Arsenio is over. <laughs> oh my. So what do you think? Did you ever, did you ever watch Arsenio? Ever? Sure. Do I actively watch it? No. Big moment for him with Bill Clinton. That's when Bill Clinton played the saxophone on his show. Right. That was obviously the big highlights. It helped Clinton, I'm sure, win the election. You really think so? Yeah, I think that it made him look more real, more down to earth. I think a lot of people embraced him. I don't want to set this to come off as prejudiced, but I think a lot of black people probably gravitated more towards him when they saw him in, on Arsenio. He got a large, I'm just speaking facts, he got a large percentage of the black vote in, in the election. Uh, and I think the black community really embraced him because he chose to go on Arsenio and he chose to do what he did, play the saxophone and sort of not speak like a politician, but speak more real to, to them. And... You know, the fact that he's a Southern boy, too. They, the, uh, a lot of the black community, especially the black community that's still in the South, seems to identify more with Southern, Southern white people who, 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 who aren't racist. I'm just, I'm just letting you hang out there, babe. Well, who aren't racist. <laughs> you know what I mean? Who, yeah. Who don't, who don't, I mean, obviously they're still, not to offend the South, but there are still, some people in the South that unfortunately are racist. There I guess are some people everywhere who are unfortunately racist. Yeah, I, mean, I suppose that's true. I, I'm just, you know, it makes me kind of upset to hear what a calculated move you believe it to be. Like, I don't, I mean, I know politicians are playing a game and they're playing to win and all of that, but it, I don't like thinking about the game. I, I just like thinking that he was this nice, charming, smart president, not worrying about oh, he's, you know, trying to get votes by acting certain ways. But I, guess... I think everything they do is to get votes. Yeah, I guess it is the way it is. 
I still think he's smart and I still think he's charming, but I also think that they probably he, he him and his team probably selected Arsenio's show specifically to appeal to black voters. And the reason I say that they have they seem to have more of affinity for southern politicians who aren't racist is because by and large black culture is an offshoot of southern culture. If you look at their food, the food, like not if you look at wow. If you look at traditional, if you look at soul food, can I say that then? Soul food, if you yes. look at soul food, which is popular in the black community, it's very southern styled. If there are any black people out here offended by what I'm saying, I'm sorry. I'm not trying to offend, but that's just how it is. They you, there there's a lot of black culture is an offshoot of southern culture because unfortunately, most of them that are in this country started in the South as slaves. So that's where they get some of their, their cultural heritage. So do you think that someone who's from the South could make macaroni and cheese as good as the macaroni and cheese that I had that was from my friend's house um, around Thanksgiving? Possibly. That was, you know, because I'm saying, my, you know, my friend's family is black. They made the best macaroni and cheese I've ever had. They had macaroni and cheese at my house once. And they said, this is not macaroni and cheese. I don't know what you're eating, but this is not it. So, yeah. I, I don't know because I don't, I don't know specifics as far as the culinary, the culinary acumen culinary. Of, of black people go. I don't know if the macaroni and cheese came from Southern cuisine or if it's a, a whole invention of the black community. I'm not sure. Okay, so if there are any black people out there listening, can you please clarify this for us? Where where did the amazing, amazing macaroni and cheese come from? Yeah, is that a... Is that and a, how do you do it? Teach is, me. Is that a black invention or is that an offshoot of Southern cooking the same way that collard greens and grits are? No matter how hard I try, I cannot make macaroni and cheese like that. That makes me sad. I'll try to make it for you. Okay, I don't think you can, but I, I'll appreciate the effort. What about the macaroni and cheese that I make with the the spinach and the artichoke? It is fantastic, but it is white people food for sure. Spinach and <laughs> artichoke dip macaroni and cheese, come on. Well, I'm saying if I did that, everything that I do with that, but without the macaroni, without the spinach and artichoke, is that sort of like the macaroni and cheese, no? No. Okay, then I don't know what they do, what they do with macaroni and cheese because I, I I've never had black people macaroni and cheese. Oh, you're missing out. I've had black people Kool Aid though. You ever had that? No. What makes Kool Aid black people Kool Aid? Grittiness. So the amount of sugar. <laughs> yeah, basically. Uh, I this is not funny because it involves a shooting. What? <laughs> but in Brightmoor, which is a community within Detroit there was a shooting over an argument over who made the better Kool-Aid. Are you freaking serious? Two, two people got into an argument over whose Kool-Aid was better and it ended up in a shooting. I think I'm almost positive that the man shot survived but Kool-Aid is important to to black uh, people or at least certain sex of them. What? Yeah. Who? shoot somebody over kool-aid well imagine if somebody okay so i'm gonna bring it to the whitest possible place imagine if somebody in the neighborhood said you don't have a nice lawn <laughs> your lawn is not well maintained i could see a fight ensuing over that maybe it wouldn't come to gunshots but i could see two white people getting into a fight over that i, I could see my that, lawnmower yeah. Man, you know, manicures my my lawn better. Interesting thing that we found out today. I'm just thinking about this. The smell that you smell. A our friend Ava told us this. The the smell that you smell when you first cut grass is a distress signal released by the grass. That is so messed up. Because it's being cut. Do you? I mean, like that makes me think of like the grass being in pain. I mean, I know yeah. they can't feel pain, right? I mean, cuz it's not sentient. Well, they don't have they don't have nerve cells right. in that way, in the way that that mammals do. But the fact that it's being hurt. Yeah, if you like the smell of freshly cut grass, then you like the smell of grass in distress. So messed up. <laughs> so, now that we're off of Arsenio and his incredibly long fingers. <laughs> let's 
Let's. Mm, what do you think that's about? <laughs> wow. I don't know. I've heard things though. I guess we'll have to ask Eddie Murphy, who uh, Beverly Hills Cop Three premiere. I can't wait. Premieres coming, and they're they're doing a premiere downtown for charity. Eddie Murphy should be here. They haven't confirmed that he's going to be here, but his camp is famously cloistered about whether where they're going to appear and when. So he should be here, though. I would I would assume for the the premiere and that's that's going to be good for the the area yeah well i mean you know the first beverly hills cop was shot in detroit mm-hmm. i mean oh, the parts that Partially actually took shot in place detroit. in detroit yeah they used uh they used the the police chief, chief. Of police yeah, yeah that's yeah that's a great story anyway so i'm gonna blow right past that story <laughs> and go to judy tenuta the uh famous comedian is appearing in ann arbor we're doing a lot of localish news, but if you're a fan of Judy Tenuta and you're near Ann Arbor, like we are, go go down and uh, check out the show. I don't know if it's sold out. It might be. I've never heard of her. Really? Really? She's not a big fan of comedians. I am. Judy Tenuta is a, a famous comedian. She does a lot of, uh, I don't know, she puts on voices a little bit. Where have you heard her stuff? Comedy Central mostly. Well, see here, here again, you have cable and I don't. You can watch cable anytime you're over. I don't. House. Care. You're in my bedroom enough that you can turn <laughs> Shut on up. cable. I'm not in your bedroom that often. We hang out there. <clears throat> <laughs> so moving on, we uh, last bit of news: the crash test dummies will be at Pine Knob. What a dumb name. You don't like it? Do you? Crash test dummies? Like yeah. when they test cars? I know what a crash test dummy is. Thank you. I don't know. It's Any band name could be considered dumb. What about Pearl Jam? Pearl Jam is awesome. You don't talk about Pearl Jam unless it's how awesome they are. But you know what their name refers to. No. Masturbation. What? Pearl Jam on your fingers. Yeah, that's yeah, that's refers to masturbation. <laughs> oh my god! Maybe Crash Test Dummies is a better name. You just ruined Pearl Jam for me. <laughs> no, they're still a good band, but the, I've never loved their name. Wow. Nirvana. Nirvana is a good Rest name. Rest in peace, Kurt Cobain. Yeah. A much better name than Pearl Jam, in my opinion. Green Day is a good name. What do you think? Yeah, Green Day's fine. What do you think of? What do you think of their? their song the crash test dummies that mm, 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 song i think it's dumb i think their name is dumb i think the song is dumb i don't love the guy's voice it's unique but i don't love it i I guess i guess i should be talking about voices but i'm sure you guys are sick of hearing mine i don't like anything about it once there was this boy who (laughs) it's so weird yeah the whole the song's weird the band name's weird. The voice is weird. It's all bad. He sounds like, I don't know if you'll remember this uh, from reruns way back when, but the Little Rascals. You remember, you know, there's Alfalfa and yeah. all those people. There was a dude named Froggy, I think was his name. And it was a little kid. The joke was he was a little kid like the rest of them. But he talked like this. He had this like froggy voice. <laughs> like he'd been smoking forever? Yeah, that's what, exactly. That's what this guy sounds like to me. That's what he reminds me of. <laughs> Maybe he smokes. Oh, okay. On to the next segment. So last week we brought to you some of the, what did we call it? Massive, massive heart line, massive heart connection. Massive. Uh, massive love. love. Massive love. Yeah. So we brought you that uh, looking at some of the classifieds from the newspaper. These are from our newspaper the detroit news (laughs) so if you're looking for any of this you can you can check it out uh this is from the the alternative section of the the love line so first one first and only ad so it's a limited time they ain't doing any more ads (laughs) you want in on this you need to come now young couple seeks bi curious female for first time experience will answer all responses immediately 
immediately. You, you know that the, the, the husband part of that duo wrote that. <laughs> we will answer all responses immediately. What do you think the three A's is about? I think that's to get them the first the first one. Oh, to get them in the first okay. one in the section. That makes sense. Like when you look in the, the phone book and something's called AAA repairs right or something i think that's what they i think that's why they did that so and it's funny too because it's not three it's six right i mean they, they, they really wanted to make sure they anticipated other people doing <laughs> doing several a's in a row and i i'd love to hear that negotiation between the husband and wife now we, we think four no, no 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 more than four well let's let's go ten that's too many that makes us look desperate Let's go down to six, <laughs> well, and that'll be the sweet spot of aren't they A's. Are paying per letter, too? Y- yeah. Yeah, that's kind of crazy. They're willing to shell out some monies for any bi-curious women out there. And it does say female, right? Yeah, bi-curious female. So they're looking for, well, you know what they're looking for. Well, yeah. Uh, let's see. <laughs> this one, these ones always skeeve me out. Mm-hmm. A attract. First of all, it says a attractive instead mm-hmm. of an attractive, so already not good at grammar, or maybe didn't want to pay for that n. Right. Pro- professional, clean, healthy, married white male is seeking females and couples for discreet fun. Again, all calls answered. So, singles and couples. Yeah, that's interesting. A guy is looking for a threesome with another guy. Not something I would recommend. Well, you're not gay. True. Or bi. Yeah, but he's also looking for females or couples. So maybe he just wants action so bad that he'll put up with another guy. Maybe. That's sad. I'm just reading these straight from the newspaper, so I haven't I haven't vetted them for funniness yet. <laughs> Let's see. Attractive, slim, white couple. Another couple. Seeking a bi-curious female. It's always females. For adult fun, must be clean and discreet. Yeah, everybody, everybody wants to, you know, make sure they're clean. Like, do you think everybody in the world is dirty? And if they're not clean, are they going to tell you? Yeah, I assume what they mean by clean is they don't have AIDS. I know, but I mean, you're you're putting a lot of trust out there. I mean, I'd want paperwork if you're they're answering an ad. Absolutely, it's someone you don't even know. Right. And here's the thing: the the women in these relationships, do they not have friends? Right. Like, you have to put an ad in the paper? You, you can't find a friend that was willing to go along with your debauchery? And do you notice how it's always bi-curious? Not bisexual. They want somebody who's not sure yet. They want somebody who's oh, curious. Someone that it, hasn't it done it yet. It plays into the fantasy of, you know, oh, they're not going to be sure and we got to, you know, get them to do it. You have, uh, you, you seem like you have some experience in this. <laughs> no. Okay. God, what do you think? I don't know. I rarely think. Adventurous, clean, handsome, 35-year-old married white male seeks exciting older, 40 to 55. What kind of fetish is that? I don't know. Married white female. Do you also need the spark back in your life? (laughs) Wow. Oh, this one's funny to me. What? Adventurous millionaire. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> it's like the guy from Gilligan's Island. Lovey, would you like a bi-curious woman? Attractive, married, or busy? Yeah, it so, says busy. Single uh, lady. So they just want to make sure you're not going to want too much of their time. Apparently. At first I thought maybe it was married or busty. <laughs> but no, it says busy. Single lady, 30 to 45, to share special times together. Sense of humor important. <laughs> Sense of humor is important in your affair. Mm-hmm. I agree. If you can't laugh about your affair, you know, what can you laugh about? Right? Yeah, millionaire. That is that is funny. Just putting that out there. That's that's someone that doesn't, doesn't have, is not very attractive. Doesn't look good. <laughs> it's like a guy that's ugly but has a really big penis is always looking for ways to get that into the conversation. Well, I doubt he's really a millionaire. It's like they go to get a sub. It's like, oh, that's a foot-long sub. You know what else is a foot-long? <laughs> uh, 
Yeah. Well, I, do you really? You think that's false advertising? Do you think he's also not adventurous? <laughs> but I mean, like, if he's really a millionaire, why would he need to take an ad out in the Detroit Free Press? That's a solid point. You would think that all he'd have to do is, you know, put a hundred dollar bill uh, in, in a zipper, <laughs> <laughs> and women would come flocking, right? That's terrible. Well, that's kind of what you're saying. No, but I mean, there's plenty of girls out there that would be interested in dating a guy with money. That's true. Nice looking black couple in their 20s seeking boyfriend. Okay. 20 to 30, who is clean. Gotta be clean. Everybody's gotta be clean. Discreet. Don't you think that they should just, that should just be a given, right? right. If you're answering an ad, you should be clean and discreet. People. Exactly. Uh, and knows what having fun is about and wants to share fantasy. Do they th- does that mean that they're going to they're gonna play Dungeons and Dragons or <laughs> are they going to see are they gonna read Lord of the Rings to each other? I, I don't I don't they're seeking a boyfriend. That sounds like they want a a commitment. Yeah, it does, but that also sounds like they wanna play games. What kind of games? Fantasy games. So Dungeons and Dragons? No. <laughs> All right. Uh, hey, here's one. Finally, we have an open-minded couple. Attractive black couple interested in meeting a discreet, doesn't have to be clean, <laughs> by or by curious. There you go. So can be totally by or just by curious female for sensuous adult relationship. <laughs> sensuous. What a word. Like moist. Why is oh god? Why is this <laughs> under alternative? Attractive, considerate Italian divorced white male, 41, six foot two, two hundred pounds. So some good stats. Seeking single, divorced, or married oh, or married. There you go. Female for friendship and pleasure. All replies answered. So he's divorced. You think he cheated? That's why he doesn't have a problem with with having a you know with a married woman or do you think that he was cheated on and this is revenge Ooh, ooh, that that sounds that sounds like it could be he's italian so you know they're big into revenge <laughs> i'm just gonna offend every race and and nationality nationality and and gender this this episode that's what i've decided now uh you're not planning a career in politics, right? I thought, no. I thought that said 11, says 33. God, 11, S- ew. Attractive, single black male, 33, six foot seven. Wow. 240 pounds, seeking naughty married or single females, not picky, for intimate adventures and adult fun. Age, race, and weight, unimportant. So basically, he's very desperate. Age, race, and weight, unimportant. So what if a 300 pound, a 300 pound 14 year old female approached him? Would it be unimportant then, sir? I think you mean adults. Well, I, I think that the adults part is implied since it's a classified ad. Maybe the clean part's implied too in this as well. I hope so. Maybe cleanliness is not important. Maybe nothing is important to him. You don't have to be single. You don't have to be good looking. If he's if he's 6'7 240 and attractive so I guess there's there's maybe limited prospects at 6'7 that's yeah. A, that's a tall man. Like, can you imagine me dating somebody that tall? I'm only 4'11". Yeah, I would I would hate that. Well, if I, you were dating someone that tall. I'm sure. But, yeah, 240 and 6'7", that's, you know, he's probably nicely trim. Yeah. 240 is not too big at 6'7". But depending on how much muscle you have, I guess. He might be ugly in the face. Could be. Could be ugly in the face. <laughs> But he says attractive, <laughs> and it's all in capital letters. But don't they all say they're attractive? Yes. Every single one of these that doesn't start with a bunch of A's starts with attractive. <laughs> Eager to please white male, 46, attractive, 
clean, discreet. So he is also clean and discreet. Sir, I have some people that might be interested in your yeah, services. Right. <laughs> Slender anxiously seeks, anxiously seeks an assertive female to change my naughty behavior. Oh, my. Someone's looking for a spanking. Yep. He's eager to please. <laughs> Ooh, east side only. That's, uh... He doesn't have a car. That's racist. <laughs> east side only. We're on the west side, just for those of you not in Michigan. No males. <laughs> sounds like he said. Sounds like he said communication issues in the past. <laughs> Bi curious white female, looking. Oh, okay. So it's a girl, but East Side only. Wow. Bi curious white female looking for my first experience. Well, again, I've got some people that are. So, yeah, save yourself to. the money. Why, why take out the ad? Just respond. I am forty four, five nine, tall woman. Blue-eyed brunette who wants a friendship with another single white female should be clean. Doesn't have to be, but you should be clean. <laughs> Just that's a general rule. You should you should be AIDS-free. Discreet and open with my male partner. Live in possible. Okay, so she's looking for a threesome too. Yeah, but she's looking for she's looking to create a household here. This is a Mormon wife. <laughs> Uh, offense to the Mormons. Do you have like a checklist? That Scandinavia you're just... sucks, by the way. <laughs> All of it. Norway, Sweden, Iceland, that D1. Denmark? Yeah. <laughs> All of it. You can go to hell. No offense. Are you just jealous because they're no all offense. blonde and blue eyed and beautiful? Wow. Oh, so I. Okay. <laughs> wow. <laughs> I thought I had nice eyes. You do, but I'm they're not, not blue. I'm not blonde. And you're not blonde. They're kind, they're blue sometimes. They're bluish sometimes. They're, they're mostly green. Okay, well. They are blue sometimes, and you are beautiful. <laughs> Hi, ladies. This is the last one I'm going to do. Okay. <laughs> Hi, ladies. Attractive, ladies. Attractive married white male, 44, seeks women. So more than one, apparently. 30 to 55. Wow. For discreet romantic times, give me a ring. You won't be disappointed. Ending it that way makes me think you will definitely be disappointed. For sure. I mean, honestly, I think most of these people live their lives in disappointment. <laughs> That's a way to bring it down. Yeah, <laughs> probably true. Most of them probably clutch the newspaper crying. Most, most <laughs> wow. E even the millionaire that wants to cheat on his wife. So totally not a millionaire, but yes. Yeah. So maybe he owns a maybe he owns a car wash or something. I don't know. I mean he's gotta have enough money to fake it. Maybe it's Art Van. What why are you why? Why why Art Van? No offense to Art Van. Slander. And I'm sure that it's not Art Van. Anyway, yes. So, now, we watched the first episode of 90210 on the box set. Carol, take us through the first episode of 90210. Thanks again for the box set, sweetie. You're welcome. Okay, so 90210, first episode, we've got Bran Brendan... Brandon, damn it. Is this the <laughs> is this the origin of you getting his name wrong? Apparently. Okay, Brenda and Brandon, they just moved to Beverly Hills and they're getting used to all of the insaneness. They came from the Midwest. Minnesota. Right? They have no accent, but they came from Minnesota. Now, even I could tell that Brenda's outfit was not the right first day of school choice. Like, she was all worried about it and then she wore, like, the plainest thing she could find. Like... I don't remember what she, she was, wore. I'm sure you don't. But, girls, she was wearing a pretty dress. Okay. And she asked Brandon about what she should wear. And then she ended up wearing a freaking turtleneck and jean jacket to school. Like, what, what are you doing? Well, first of all, what a person to ask your brother for <laughs> fashion advice. Second of all, I think jean jackets were, this is, this is four years ago. When this came out. So we're talking 1990. I assume this was probably filmed in 89. 
when they started filming the series. Okay. But it premiered in, in 1990, so four years ago. Jean jackets were... I mean, fashion's changed a lot in the last four years. Jean jackets were probably more in vogue at that time period. Probably, but I mean, I didn't see anyone else wearing one. This no. is Beverly Hills. We saw a, a girl in a... We saw a girl's ass in, yes. a, in a tight... In a tight miniskirt about five times in the opening montage of the school. <laughs> the, the camera's taking us around the school, and it's the same girl, always from behind, never saw her face, but she's always just walking somewhere. Yeah, I think the camera guy had a thing for her. Apparently. But um, I think that she looked fine for her first day of school in the Midwest. Like, if she were going to school here, she had been fine. Okay. But, yeah, everybody there was dressed, like, to the nines. I mean, they even talk about... Um, Some to the tens. Right? I don't know what that means. <laughs> they even talked about, at, at school, like, how some of the kids are, like, the children of celebrities, and everybody's rich, and, you know, so it's a different different kind of playing field, different... It's a very exclusive high school. Yeah. In Beverly Hills. I would not want that kind of pressure. West Beverly High. It sounds terrible. The west side of Beverly must be the best side of Beverly. They have valet parking. Yeah. I valet can't parking imagine. at their high school. We have a parking lot attendant, but he doesn't actually, I guess he's really a security, and, you know, he can be bribed with, like, cheeseburgers and stuff, so. <laughs> yeah, he's supposed to keep you from leaving campus. Yeah, he does not. Um... <laughs> Shout out to whatever your name is that lets us we leave campus. We love you. <laughs> anyway, um, so there's a party. And again, with the over-the-top, we-have-money way of doing things. Well, we get some stuff in the school, too, you know. We meet some people. Uh, yeah, I know. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead. Well, I just I, are we going in order, or are we just going haphazardly? I don't know. I was lazy, it. and I didn't, didn't take, take notes. notes. <laughs> calling <laughs> we meet kelly mm -hmm. and steve steve immediately establishes himself as a huge douchebag yeah he's her ex-boyfriend uh -huh. so that's something that we don't really see you know any kind of a relationship no. there now can't even imagine it yeah with that terrible perm of his and she got a nose job yeah i don't think the actress actually got a nose job no. Unless it's a really, really good nose job. I mean, yeah, I think she's way too pretty. It doesn't look like she had a nose job. You made the comment that she's prettier now than she is when she gets older. Yeah. No, I didn't say that. I said she's prettier when she's older, didn't I? I thought you said she was She was, There was more of a difference now between her and Brenda as far as attractiveness than there was... I was talking about Brenda. Oh, Brenda gets prettier as she goes Yeah. Older. Yeah, well, she looks very young. Yeah. Like, she actually looks kind of like a high schooler. I think most of them were, and, and then you've got, you know, Andrea, who looks... At, in the beginning... <laughs> in the beginning... Andrea's mistaken for the teacher in several right. scenes. Yeah, she, uh, she looks like she's probably 25. I think they did that on purpose. Because she's so studious and driven. Mm -hmm. She says she wants to go to an Ivy League school. We know that's not going to happen. Oh, poor Andrea. Andrea, you're going to get knocked up and go to California University or whatever the hell it's called. Yeah, she's pretty um, pretty invasive too. Like, Brandon wants to work on the school yearbook and she's running the school yearbook. And she asks him, okay, I have two assignments. One, you can go film the girls swim team right and the other you can um something about toxic waste yeah or so something that's at the school you know that luke were he on this show luke perry what's his name dylan yeah you know if dylan dylan would jump at that because of how much he cares about the environment right right <laughs> but he does but he's not in this episode actually yeah i wonder when i don't remember when he comes in don't know hmm. never seen it We'll find out. Yeah, I barely remember it, honestly. Like, I mean, I remember liking it, and that's about it. Like, I don't remember the details. So, we'll see. Sounds like your first time. <laughs> what <laughs> is wrong with you? <laughs> My parents listen to this. 
<laughs> I remember He doesn't it. know. Don't remember the detail. Oh, I don't? No. Yeah, sure. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. The party. <laughs> Shut up. There's a party. There is a party. And um, the... Speaking of losing it, there's a party. These people lose it. A plane flies over the school mm -hmm. with a banner inviting them all to this girl's house. Yeah, they really go over the top with in this episode with how opulent their lifestyle right. is. And um, everybody's all excited. And oh, oh, you see um, David. <laughs> David, what the hell is his name? David Silver? Gawarno? David Silver. Okay. Um, with his friend who is not in the later episodes. No, some dork. Yeah. And uh, they're, they're freshmen. So I, I kind of got the impression he was younger than everybody. I guess he is. And they're all excited, and then at the end of it, it says no freshmen. So, mm -hmm. but they they go anyway. Yeah, they crash this party, and I don't know why they said no freshmen because they obviously didn't check. Right. Yeah. What are they gonna do? ID at the door? Let me see your student ID. Right. And um, this party is insane. It reminds me of like a wedding reception slash pool party. Yeah. They've, there's a pool, and yeah, go ahead. They've got uh, you know, catering. They've got people walking around with trays of hors d'oeuvres and. Uh, like you said, live band and the pool. It's it looks amazing. I want I want a party like that. Okay, well, all we need is a ten million dollar home, <laughs> and then the money to hate to hire a bunch of caterers. Well, I mean, we we have a pool in the backyard, and yeah. um, we could pay some freshmen to cater, and we could just That's invite the whole school and see what happens. What does that mean? Are, are you? <laughs> Are you trying to get on the uh, the classified X? <laughs> Attractive single white female seeking whole school. What is wrong with you? <laughs> see what happens. I don't know what that means. I just need to see how many people show up. Oh yeah. I mean I don't it's think It's a free party, I'm pretty sure they're all showing up. I don't think so. Um yeah, so maybe we maybe have to get the neighbors in on it too. Then we don't need a ten million. <laughs> Again, get the neighbors in on it. Out of context doesn't sound good. We don't need a ten million dollar house. Is all I am saying. Okay. Yeah, we do have the pool. Yeah. We, uh, band though. I mean, I play in a band. Well, yeah. Get your buddies over here. All right. We we can totally do this. Sure. Okay. Who are you gonna dance with though? If I'm playing. Um, I'll just dance in front of you. Okay, sounds good. <laughs> All right, so they have this party, and of course, even though it's a high school party, there's tons of alcohol everywhere. Yeah. And um, Steve is keeps like stalking poor Kelly around the party, trying to you know talk to her, and he ends up getting completely wasted because she finally tells him to leave her alone. Yeah, he befriends David. Yeah. And he says to David, "Oh, I dumped her." He's yeah. like, "Oh, you used to date her?" Yeah, I dumped her. Such a lie. Um. And then he's trying to drive and nobody will let him. And he's like, oh, there's my buddy David. He'll drive me home. Yeah. David has no license. Right. He's a freshman. So, yeah. He does drive him home, though. He does. And he successfully gets him there. Mm-hmm. And he goes inside. Even though the cops, <laughs> the cops pull up next oh, to God, him. Oh, God, yeah. I forgot about that. And he puts on a football helmet for some reason. He, I guess he thinks if they see his face, they'll just say, oh, that's a... That's a 15-year-old, not a 16-year-old. Right. We can tell that one-year difference, and they're going to immediately pull him over. So instead, to be inconspicuous, he <laughs> puts a football helmet on and then just looks at them and cheers West Beverly High or whatever. Yeah, it was pretty dumb. I think that doing that would be more likely to get him pulled over because he seemed like he was on drugs. And... I'm shocked they didn't pull him over. Right. And I don't think it's legal to drive with a helmet on. It seems like a visual impediment. Right. Yeah, very weird. So he um, puts the car in neutral and set a park. Yeah, on a hill. And it rolls. <laughs> like he's from the Midwest where everything's flat. <laughs> yeah, it rolls down and smashes into a car and then he runs away. <laughs> That's what I would do. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to remember if there was anything else worth mentioning about this episode. For what, some weird reason, it comes back to just a montage of what's happening next week without 
Yeah. Without any context at all. Yeah, I thought something was wrong with the tape. I, th- I was like, what, what is happening? I thought it was like getting eaten. I was scared. And then it just, yeah, it just does the montage of what's happening next week. And then we go into the, the that sweet end credit music. Oh, and by the way, Tori Spelling, she was way prettier as a teenager. Was she in this episode? Because I don't yes, remember seeing her. she was one of Kelly's friends. I even said to you she was prettier. I don't think I saw... Oh my gosh, well I'll point her out to you the next episode. Cause Did she get a reverse nose job? <laughs> I don't know what happened. And something to make her it's, eye lazier? It's like her head grew. Her head was not always that big. Oh, weird. Yeah. That happens to the spelling kids. <laughs> they find out it's on the day that they see how much money their father makes. Their heads grow three sizes like the Grinch's heart. <laughs> <laughs> That's the problem. No, I mean... Her eye is collecting unemployment. That's how easy it is. You're so mean. Uh, well, she's not attractive, and she's incredibly rich and famous. I think she should be brought down a pick. Just she, like, uh, what's his name? Scott Sanders. Steve Sanders. Steve Sanders, yes. Yeah. Ian needs, Ziering. Ian Ziering, yeah. Ian Ziering needs to be brought down a pig, too. I think he's already down many pegs. <laughs> Good luck finding work after this when you're known as the asshole for the uh, entire series. The ugly asshole. Oh, anyway. So, now, on to the film. The, the, the film that we saw this week. Carol's Pick. It was a really good movie. Number four in, at the, in the box office this week. But... I was dehydrated when we left the theater because I cried so much. Right. Uh, we saw When a Man Loves a Woman. Yep. Andy Garcia, Meg Ryan, couple cute kids, very <laughs> good actresses. Yeah, I think the kids were like probably the best uh, actors in the movie. Not that the not that the uh, adults Meg didn't Ryan do a was good job, good. but yeah, I mean, no, everybody was good, but yeah, the kids were impressive. That dude, Philip Seymour Hoffman, was in the movie for a a brief period. You may remember him as the asshole that turns on Chris O'Donnell's character in the film uh, Scent of a Woman. I'm trying to remember. When they do the trial thing at the end. Or the, oh, It's not yeah. really a trial, but it's sort of a tribunal of the school yeah. against Chris O'Donnell. He's the guy on the other side. He started out like as his friend, and then he rats on him or, or whatever it is. I'm trying to remember yeah. the exact plot of that film. But yeah, he's the asshole in that, that thing, the one that... Al Pacino dresses down for being a spineless coward. Right. But um I, I really like this movie. It's a it's it's very, very touching and but just so sad. I mean like I, I recommend that you see it, but I don't know if I'll ever see it again. It was written by Al Franken, uh, that some of you may remember from the very early days of Saturday Night Live. And come back on Saturday Night Live as well after after he left after Lauren Michaels left he was one of the writers and he he would occasionally be he didn't do many skits but he'd occasionally be on weekend updates okay and he's he's the one he talks kind of slow and he's got sort of a deeper voice he's got that big hair it like it's almost like a Jewish afro kind oh, of oh jeez well it's not it's not as curly as that but it's like a big bouffant hair hairstyle Anyway, you'd know him if you saw him. Okay. But he he wrote it, and I'm trying to remember the name of the other guy. I think it's Richard Bass, or Rich Bass, something like that, who wrote Rain Man. Oh, wow. So he wrote it with Al Franken. Uh, so obviously... Talented. A, a good writing staff behind it. And basically, the plot of the film is that Andy Garcia and Meg Ryan are married. We get a a bit of an insight into their marriage in the very first scene <laughs> as Meg Ryan is at a cafe and she gets hit on by this guy. And I love this. Andy Garcia comes up and starts hitting on her and says, you know, I've got a, I've got a problem. I've got a fly and my dry cleaning needs to be picked yeah, up. Cause he's a pilot and he's in his pilot's uniform. Yeah. I've got, I've got dry cleaning that needs to be picked up. So, you know, here's my address. Here's the keys. Can you pick it up for me? I'll give you some money to do it. And then, you know, drop it off around midnight. And she says, you know, why wouldn't I just drop it off when I want to drop it off? 
And he says, because I wouldn't be able to thank you properly. And he says, oh, you know, I bake and I do all this stuff. And the, the whole time this guy's watching right. what, uh, what he's doing. And then she sits on his lap <laughs> and starts kissing him and says, he says, did the plumber come this afternoon or whatever? <laughs> it's very clear they're married right. at this point. And he's sort of, you know, chagrin, his chagrined and moves on to the next woman. On the yeah, other side just him. turns around to the other girl. <clears throat> but they uh, they go out to a party after that and we see... No, it wasn't a party. It's their anniversary. They were going out okay. to dinner. So, yeah, they went out to dinner, but they danced, too. Yeah. And he's he's dancing with other women sometimes, like, too. No, 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 no. There was just the one time, and it was because she made him. Oh, okay. Well, anyway, he's, you know, but he's being very charming and stuff. This is the part of the movie where I found out that I am no match for Andy Garcia, apparently. You're ridiculous. As far as a, a life partner goes, since we're not married yet. Yeah, he's like, no one could live up to that. And I nodded. Yep. I nodded because no one could. It's a fucking fantasy. Yeah, I'm not as good as Andy Garcia. I, apparently, I have work to do. I never said that. I never thought of it. I need to be more charming. You're very charming. Uh-huh. How do you think you got me? <laughs> I, I, I broadcast. Uh, we had that sub sandwich. <laughs> and I said, you know what else is long? <laughs> That's how I got you. <laughs> Anyway. <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah. So quite he's long. he's incredibly wow. Okay. So he's incredibly yeah. Maybe not quite foot, but you know. He got big hands. Anyway. <laughs> we... So anyway, uh, the party happens. She gets very drunk. It's not a party. The anniversary celebration happens, and. She gets very drunk. I mean, she was already drinking when they left. Remember, she walked out of the house with him with a bottle in her hands. Okay. So. I didn't pay attention to all the details of the film you did. Okay. But <clears throat> he, so she's very drunk. This Porsche is, alarm is going off. She screams, there are people trying to have sex up here. <laughs> then she goes down with a dozen eggs and starts throwing it at the car. So crazy. She says it's that Porsche again, so obviously this is a problem yeah. with this car. And they throw eggs at the car. Yeah, he just joins her. And smears egg all over her, which, God, is terrible. And then she does it to him, too, though. Uh, I mean, they're both look. I mean, that's just nasty. They're going to have to take a shower after yeah. that. I don't know it's if not she sexy. did, though. Like, in the morning when she's waking up, she doesn't look very clean. Oh, wow. Just dried egg all over. Ugh. So... She, uh, you know, it become it starts to become a little clearer at this point that there might be a problem, and we get shades of him not being the greatest husband in the world, and it, this is where it kind of becomes clear too that her oldest daughter is from a previous marriage or, or relationship, relationship, and their youngest daughter is theirs together. So they are at breakfast. And the oldest daughter didn't do her homework like she said she was going to do. And she's she wanted to go to her friend's house. And she's complaining that she it's not due till Monday and she can do it on the weekend. And Meg Ryan's character says, I told you not to save it till the last minute. So right. you're not going to your friend's house. And he comes in and takes over and says... You know, oh, you've got all you can handle with that cup and that little spoon. Because she's having coffee. Right. And, and because, presumably, because she is a hangover. Yeah. And he comes in and says, look, you know, you can go to you can go to her house. That's fine. I'll help you with your project. All this stuff. Now, from stuff that we find out later in the movie, I get why he does this. Yeah. For two reasons. One, he's trying to protect her. Do you know basically coddle her? He's co- like, what is it? Uh, enabling her. Yeah. He enables her drinking, uh, because of his protective nature, and he's trying to show the oldest daughter, who's not biologically his, that he loves her. Yeah. He wants to be the nice guy, wants her to like him, so that's why he's doing this stuff. It's not excusable. That's not how you should handle a marriage. But I get. One of the things I like about this script is you can see the different sides yeah. of people. 
especially in retrospect. For sure. Because at first I was just like, oh, he's an asshole, is what I was thinking. But as the movie goes on, we, we see more about his character. We learn more about what, what his actual fears are and his, his emotional state is. Then it becomes clear why he was doing that. And it gives more context to the situation mm -hmm. and how things got to where they are. So the, you know, the bottom, the bottom hits out when there are certain things where it's clear that drinking is affecting her life. Well, it's actually, I mean, it's, 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 um, related precisely to what you're talking about though. That, that scene is kind of the catalyst for what happens with her. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. Because she, she, um, is so just upset and feels so demeaned and, um, she goes out and gets totally wasted and when she comes home, she says to her daughter, who, who's asking, first of all, the babysitter is there and wants to stay because she can tell how fucked up she is. No, 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 you're skipping. I'm skipping. Go ahead, then. Yeah. Because the next thing that she does is she goes out drinking with her friend from work when he's supposed to be flying. Okay. And the babysitter can't stay. So he ends up missing his flight. Right. Missing work, basically, to stay home with the kids. And I think that's a retaliation move part of that's a retaliation move okay. for what happened in the kitchen that day and she says oh you know I, I'm, I'm sorry I can't believe I forgot your flight she knew about it because she said to she said to her co-worker when she invited her out that he's got a flight yeah she knew about it but then she got trashed I think it's retaliation I think that's what it's supposed to be implying that she knew and she didn't care because of how he treated her that's my that's my thought, and she you know she doesn't want to come right out and say that. So yeah, they're playing games. Both of them are kind of playing games with each other at this point in the relationship. So she comes back. He's mad, obviously, and um, you know she like this is where it kind of becomes clear that drinking is a problem for her. And so now go on with what what, what you were saying. Well, because okay. that's kind of the next major part. Okay, so the babysitter's trying to stay, and she's like, Amy, go home, leave, leave. Like, she just makes her go. And her daughter is on the computer showing her – Show it's so cute. She's showing her doll how to use the computer, and she's like, Mom, Jessica drew a Buick, and it's green. And she's just like, do your homework. Yeah. It was, it was, it was a really upsetting scene. So little girl's, like, following Mom around. Are you okay? Are you sick? Like, she's genuinely worried about her mom. Mm -hmm. Watches Mom – down aspirin with a fifth of vodka. Yep. And then mom just turns around and hits her. Yeah, because she says something again, you know, if she's okay. Yeah. And she slaps her across the face hard. Yeah. Later we see a mark. It's it's really bad. And then and then the little girl takes her doll and goes up in her her bed in the top of the bed and she's holding her and she's like, You're a good girl. Yeah, and she's You're a good girl. And it's just like oh. she's crying and stuff. And her mom is taking a shower. Meg Ryan's taking a shower. And she passes out and falls through the glass. Yeah. And so she called, the little girl calls the dad, Andy Garcia, and says, Mom is dead. Yeah, Mommy died. Yeah. <laughs> oh. And she says, you know, what happened, that, uh, you know, she's lying on the floor, there's glass all around her, and she's not moving, she's dead. Now, mind you, he's on a trip. He's an airline pilot. He's not even there. He's in the hotel lobby. Somehow she tracked him down. What I think is funny is he's actually at the airport bar. Oh, is that where he was? Yeah. So him and a bunch of other pilots are just sitting around the airport bar. <laughs> that makes me feel safe. I don't like flying anyway. <laughs> well, I don't think he was drinking. Or... It didn't look like it. And and maybe maybe he was. Maybe he was just done with the flight. You know. Could be, but that's it. Seems like that's a a, a common place that airline pilots uh, hang out, even if they're not drinking, because it's like the lounge area yeah. of the airport. That makes sense. But he gets the phone call. He calls somebody to come over, and then you know to make sure that she's okay. And then the next scene, she's in the hospital, and he says everything's going to be okay. Doctor says you're okay. Doesn't yell at her. For getting drunk, passing out, and falling through, getting so drunk while watching the kids that she passes out and falls through the glass. Doesn't yell at her about that at any point. Doesn't yell at her about hitting her daughter. Just says, and this is this is you know another thing where we get a look at this guy's character. 
everything's going to be okay. We'll take care of everything. His solution is for them to go on vacation. No, no, that was no. He said, "We'll get you help so it doesn't happen again." Okay. It, he didn't bring up vacation. They've already been on vacation at this point. Oh, okay. Am I, I'm getting the order yeah. mixed they, up. They went on vacation after they had that fight about her not. Yeah. Her not. Um, You're right. Because yeah, went back when they were fighting because she made him miss his trip. Then she starts in about how hard her life is. You don't know how hard it is, and I have so much stress. And then he's like, "Well, you know, you have stress. Come to me." And then he's like, "Oh, you know, let's go on a vacation." So yeah, he's very much a caretaker. Yeah. So yeah. So then that's right. He says they're gonna get her help. So that's when she gets checked into the program. Right. So she goes to a what do they call it? A rehab. Yeah, facility. rehab. And she, they don't say exactly how long she's gone for, but I guess they're typically around 28 days, around a month. So the, at, at first, she can't have any calls. She's detoxing. I would assume that she's going through the DTs. We see, we see at other points before she, she goes, she tells them after the vacation that she'll qu- quit drinking. She has bottles stashed all over the house. That mm-hmm. she discreetly throws away in the middle of the night. And, you know, she's doing a bunch of this drinking on the side, hiding it from, from everyone or trying to hide it. One of the reasons why she hit her daughter, because her daughter saw her drinking and she's being very, trying to be very secretive about all this stuff. So, not that there's any excuse to hit your daughter, but that's that's sort of, I think that was part of the the reason that she did it. Well, I mean, I think in her messed up state, she was just, she was still feeling mad and small because of the whole homework thing, which is why the only words she ever said to her daughter when she came home was do your homework. And her daughter already did her homework. Yeah. She said, I already did my homework. I was just trying to tell tell you. you." And then she runs off. But anyway, so she goes there and it looks like she's getting better. Everything seems, everything seems to be going pretty well for her there in the scenes that we see after the initial detox right after the first few days it looks like you know she's actually starting to get better things at home are kind of falling apart oh yeah the poor guy because apparently andy garcia has no idea how to take care of a household it's funny he says oh you got problems and stuff you can come to me but it doesn't seem like he shares a lot of the responsibility (laughs) around the house uh also it's mentioned at one point in the movie that he's gone a lot, which obviously airline pilots are. Right. They have you know long trips that they have to go on and things like that. Depending on what route you usually fly, airline pilots usually have have pretty set routes, mm-hmm. different cities that they that they are that they go to all. Well, the yeah, time. he keeps talking about like like when he took her to Mexico, he traded someone for the Mexico route. I right. Mean, they they definitely do that. Yeah. So you know, but he's still gone a lot in different cities. Mm-hmm. So I think that's part of the problem too. Is she's left alone a lot, and you know, I mean, not 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 that alcoholism is ever the answer to anyone's problems, but you can see situations ar- arising that would lead her deeper down the path of alcoholism. Right. And obviously, part of her recovery is trying to figure out how to manage all that. So he, you know, it's falling apart at home. He's leaning on the babysitter too much. The babysitter can't watch him. There's stress at work because they're talking about layoffs and and cutbacks. And, you know, his job's being threatened because he's a more seasoned pilot. And they want to bring in newer pilots that they don't have to pay as much money to, obviously. So, you know, there's a lot of stress there. And uh, the, the... the babysitter ends up leaving at one point. Oh yeah, he he loses his mind, and I pointed out that she doesn't seem like a very good babysitter, though. You know, I I can see both sides of this too. Okay, so the kids are fighting and screaming, and apparently they were supposed to be in bed. Why is she there making herself food at this point? I don't know. But the babysitter is there making food while he's talking to his boss about possibly losing his job, mm-hmm. and the kids are screaming and fighting in the background. So he has to put the boss on hold while the babysitter is cooking. Go try to, you know, intervene with the kids. And he's like, Amy, don't you hear these kids? Yeah. No, she's pregnant. She's like way, way pregnant. Right. And she's like, yeah, I haven't eaten all day. And, you know. She should really be eating more if she's pregnant. Yeah. For one. But the, my, my point of view was put the kids to bed until it's done, until they're asleep. If you have to sing them a couple songs or whatever do that what i'm saying is she said i keep trying to put him to bed and they keep getting back up 
lay down the law. It's like the mom was the only one. Apparently, they needed some smacking. <laughs> so, uh, apparently, the mom is the only one that could get you know get them handled and in order. It's ridiculous. Yeah, aside from that one time when she was drunk, it seemed like she was you know pretty well in control of those kids. Yeah, and, yeah. But yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me, and it doesn't seem like the babysitter's doing that great of a job. But anyway, they he needs her. He's yelling at her because there was a spill, and. He he goes to get paper towel to clean it up, and there's no paper towel. And he's just like, I need somebody to go to the store and get the paper towel. But there's no paper towel. It's like, wow. That's who, a little ridiculous. Yes. Yeah, who can't handle their life? Who has right. as much as he can handle with coffee and a little spoon? I think it's him. Right. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I definitely agree with that. That's on him to supply the house with the things that it needs, because that's not a babysitter's job. Yeah, he's even like, how many stores did you pass on the way home from school that sell paper towel? Like, what the hell? Yeah, and th- this babysitter could be a a, a, a movie in, in its own right. She's right. in school, but she's pregnant. We never see a dad. Yeah. We don't get much information about her, but it's interesting. Anyway, so he starts to sort of get a handle on things, but not, not even really fully. But he kind of gets a handle on some stuff, especially when the babysitter comes back in. And in the meantime, Meg Ryan's getting real healthy and everything. Uh, Philip Seymour Hoffman is a confidant of, of sorts to her, I guess. He's getting clean in the same thing at the same time. They come to visit her, mm-hmm. and everything seems to be going well. Andy Garcia clearly doesn't seem like he fits in right. to this part of her life. And at one point, she's talking to him, and Philip Seymour Hoffman comes up and asks if he can borrow her for a minute because he's you know needs to talk to her and she's very, your wife's a very comforting person yeah right <laughs> and so you made the comment that you'd be pissed if you were Andy I, Garcia yeah I would I mean I wouldn't they have just been without her for like at least a week because they when she got dropped off they said she'd be in detox till Tuesday and now it's Sunday so it's probably been about a week since they have seen her mm-hmm. they have just this little bit of time and this guy who can talk to her all week long needs to steal her away? Yeah. It, it is understandable. Rude. So, eventually, she finishes her detox, and she's ready to go home. And she speaks to one of the nurses. I think that's what they call them, nurses or Oh, she was caregivers. the counselor. Counselor, okay. She speaks to one of the counselors about how she's feeling. She's nervous about going back home. And the counselor, who also is an alcoholic and has been through treatment, you know, says to her, yeah, you know, I know how you're feeling. You're probably scared as hell. I know I was. When I went home, how do you fit into this new life and everything? And she says, so, you know, everything worked out. And she laughed and she's like, no, we got a divorce. And they both start laughing. So she comes back and, and immediately she's not drinking. She wants to drink. I'll give you, I'll let you guys know. I'll let you off the hook. She does not relapse. Right. So the, the the treatment takes effect and she's good. She'll always want to drink because that's part of the nature of addiction. And that's something she'll have to struggle with for the rest of her life. But she doesn't, she doesn't fall off the wagon. She does pick up smoking cigarettes while she's in this place though. Yeah. Well, a lot, I think a lot of people that suffer from addiction do. Yeah. They gravitate towards that addiction. Well, and I mean, he said, I thought you'd quit. So it's not like she'd never smoked before either. Right. Anyway, so she, it becomes clear that there's a lot of friction. She doesn't know how, first of all, she's not sure exactly how to reacclimate herself to her life. But the biggest thing is her husband. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's unspoken, but I think she realizes how enabling he is. And he wants to now continue to enable, enable even more, because she's gone through this addiction. And I guess in his mind, she's broken, basically. And he wants to take care of everything. He doesn't want the kids to bother her. But that's not anything she needs. She needs a normal life. Right. And he's fighting her reacclimenting into this life. Which, you know... It's like a normal thing, I think, you know, to fight change. Yeah. It's change. Yep. And they go to a marriage counselor where she sort of elucidates more of her problems with him and and what's going on. And he goes to an Al-Anon meeting and he comes home 
talks to her about it and says, oh, it's a bunch of losers that, you know, don't want to face their own problems and, and everything. Sitting around feeling sorry for themselves. Yeah. And she says, oh, they're not all perfect like some people, you know. And, like, it, it, it becomes this big fight. She says that she might want to go to a halfway house. One of the people that she was in the treatment with, you know, is not doing well in her home environment. She goes to a halfway house. He takes it personally, says that, oh, the problem's me, basically, and says he's going to leave. So he leaves and stays with a friend. The and only time in the whole movie you really see him lose it. I mean, aside yeah. from that the babysitter. But, I mean, he's always so freaking quiet. Yeah, and calm, yeah. yeah. Andy Garcia does a really good job of portraying this, like, rage, like, this anger underneath the surface. Yes. Of a calm demeanor and a you know you can see as he gets angrier he just gets quieter as he gets more hurt emotionally he just gets quieter there's one point where you know she talks about she's talking about the phil philip seymour hoffman was there Mm -hmm. and they were sitting very close to each other on the couch and he's understandably a a little upset about that i'd be upset about that too. so they have this conversation and she's talking to him and his responses are basically i don't know Maybe, you know, like, it's all very quiet, but you can see underneath the surface, he does a really good job with with showing those emotions without being without being uh, bombastic about it. Yeah. So, and Meg Ryan does an excellent job, too, as someone struggling through this. She's a little more animated, obviously, uh, as the counterbalance to him, but, you know, she, she conveys a lot of what her inner turmoil is, too. Yes. So... They, she, at one point she says, maybe if you were able to say, I don't know, for once in your life, I could love you again. Which you can see, and this is so well acted by him, because you can see the registering of it and the hurt flash across his face that she's saying, she does not love me right now. Right. Yep. So, you know, he says, he says it, and he goes, didn't work, did it? And then he goes upstairs. And then he leaves, and... You know, she starts to get better. Like, she starts to be able to handle the kids. She starts to be able to handle her life. Mm -hmm. Uh, You know, she starts to get healthier, basically, without him there. And he's not doing as well, obviously, because, you know, part of what he needs to work through is that he needed her to need him. Yeah, he needed to be needed. And, you know, that's something that some people need, but he... He has to work through that, you know, and and respect her as an independent person as well. So, you know, he struggles through that. uh, And at the same time, it comes across that he needs to move to Denver because there are all the rollbacks in the company. He will have a better chance of keeping his job if he takes this transfer to flying out of Denver. But he clearly doesn't want to. He wants her to say not to do yeah, it yeah of course and you know she says he says you know the alternative is i could go to another airline but i'd have to start at the bottom and she says well you you know you put so many years in to start at the bottom and, which is true yeah so you know she also tells him that she's gonna have uh, a big speech at her meeting because she is six months sober 180 days sober mm-hmm. so he, she wants him to be there, and he says, you know, I don't know if I'll be able to make it, all this stuff. And they they leave each other, and there's some emotional scenes with him and his daughters. Oh, saying goodbye to his girls. Oh. Yeah, and it's it's hard, you know, uh, that that's one of the tear-jerking moments. But then she gives the speech, and it's basically, it's about what her rock bottom was, about her treatment. And about how afterwards she pushed her husband away. She made everything his fault and that wasn't fair. And she wanted to beg him to stay. You know, all this stuff, like pouring her heart out about all the things that she did wrong to her husband. And how she wanted, you know, she wants him back and she feels like she deserves a second chance. She has to believe she gets she, she should get a second chance and all this stuff. And, you know, they, she talks to some people in the crowd and then he shows up and he's like, oh, it made me cry too. And then he gives a speech about all the stuff he did wrong to her and all the things he's learned. And he's doing it, though, in a way 
where he's acting like they don't know each other. Mm-hmm. He's talking about his wife instead of, you know, to her. Like, yeah. yeah. It's shades of the beginning of right. the film. So, you know, she says, oh, you should tell her. You know, they're playing this game again. And it kind of shows that they're coming back together, you know, like, like at the beginning of the film uh, in a more healthier place. So, you know, they kiss. And I mean, that's basically the end of the end of the film, aside from an extra that <laughs> stares at them yeah. the entire time. Stares and then looks back and then stares again. Creepy. It's sort of a weird, <laughs> a weird move by this extra at the end of the film. But that's basically the movie. What Now, what did you think, you know, overall impressions of the movie and, and all that stuff? I, I mean, like I said, it's just, it's an emotional roller coaster. I think that it's so well acted, so well written. And, you know, it, the, it's very real. I mean, to, to people who have any kind of, you know, understanding, have, have been either through it themselves or know people who have been through addiction, you know, I, I think it's very true to life mm-hmm. and, and what it can do to a family. And um, I just, I, I really, I was impressed by all of it. The most fantastical element about it, I think, is the fact that it's stuck the first time around. Yeah. I know it can, but I know for a lot of people, they have to go to treatment a few different times in order to finally get healthy. Well, I mean, granted, this is the end of the movie, but I mean, she's only six months sober. That's not that long. True. She might need to to continue with it, but you get, it ends on a hopeful note so you get the you get the impression they're getting back together yeah and that uh she'll continue with her sobriety that she's found that they both they both realize what they need from each other and they're able to give it to each other now he he continues to go to the al-anon meetings and he actually shares in one of the meetings he finally gets it he gets what he gets what his role was and what his role wasn't Mm -hmm. he gets that unfairness of some of the things that she did to him and he gets the you know what he did wrong as well and he understands why you know he comes to an understanding point of why she unloaded so much of this stuff on him and the apology that she kind of gives through that speech i think is enough to yeah to mend those things and same thing for for him to her but yeah i i enjoyed it it's it's a little more overwrought than a lot of movies i i generally genuinely like or generally like, uh-huh. but it was it was very good. It was very well acted. It was very well written. Direction was was solid, and I liked the story. I enjoyed the. It was a very personal personal story of this family, including the kids. Yep. And it uh, it definitely yeah it was it was an emotional it was an emotional movie. You you were. You were crying your eyes out a few different times. Oh my goodness! Like I said, dehydrated when we left. <laughs> but yeah, it's definitely a solid one that you guys should definitely check out. Uh, when a man loves a woman, just bring tissues. The only thing I didn't really love is that it begins the movie with the song "When a Man Loves a Woman," which felt a little more kind of like hitting you over the head with it. I, I guess. I mean. Percy Sledge, although it is a good song. It's a very good song, and, and why not use it when that's the title of your movie? Yeah, I guess. There's not much I can point to that I didn't like about the film, so right. I've got a, <laughs> I've got a nitpick somewhere. Well, you know, and I, I meant to say this earlier, but I'm just thinking back to when he, they went to visit her, and all these guys are coming up to him saying how great his wife is. Oh yeah, that would he handled that really well. Yeah. That's that's all. I mean, it's like, why didn't she have any female friends there? I don't know. That's kind of weird to me. But you know, I mean, he is the greatest husband ideal. Oh, shut up. That you can that you could possibly attain, and I could only hope to one day be good enough for you to marry me. Do you hope that? But to be good enough? Yeah, <laughs> of course. No, I mean, you think about us getting married someday? Yeah, I've mentioned it before. You're you're a little. Uh... I don't know. I love you. Yeah, see, every time we bring this up, you you basically say you don't want to get married to me ever. I'm not saying ever, but it's like, you know, you're kind of jumping ahead. Only in high school. Well, that's... What what am I supposed to think? Eventually we'll get... Eventually we'll break up? Is that what I'm supposed to think? No, I just... I don't think that far ahead. Well, I think farther ahead than you do, I guess. I guess so. What do you see for the future? Wow, let's not go there right now. <laughs> so, Blockbuster Pick of the Week. 
Okay, well, our blockbuster pick of the week this week is Dr. Doolittle by Process of Elimination. <laughs> there is not much coming out to Blockbuster this week. And I don't like Dr. Doolittle. Me either. I didn't like the I, the original with Rex Harrison. I wasn't the biggest fan of. He's much better in My Fair Lady. And this remake with Eddie Murphy is not that funny to me. It's better than the original, in my opinion. I, I like yeah. Eddie Murphy. But yeah, it's not a very good movie. He'll be Too better. corny. He'll be better in Beverly Hills Cop 3, I'm sure. But unfortunately, we've never seen any of the other movies that we could have talked to you about. So No, there was some foreign movies that came out this week and some... Something called Tarantula? Yeah, some more off-the-wall kind of stuff. Yeah. So, yeah, not a lot of, not a lot of big releases... Uh, this week, maybe in deference to the holiday, Memorial Day. Oh, that I makes guess. sense, yeah. I don't know. But mm, I think next week, because those blockbuster pamphlets, they go about uh, two months in advance. I think mm-hmm. next week looks better, if I remember correctly from the pamphlet. Most weeks look better than this week. Yeah. I mean, when Dr. Doolittle is the one we have to recommend. Right. If you like corny comedy and Eddie Murphy, go rent Dr. Doolittle. If not... I don't know. I mean, I guess rent the breakfast club like (laughs) like we did that one week. Right. But that is our show for the week. Uh, Obviously, as always, tell a friend about the the show. You can uh, you can paste a piece of paper with five stars on Carol's Locker if you want to. (laughs) You know, no, 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 no. Money. Money in Carol's Locker. Yeah. Put money in Carol's Locker. You can take the stars. Anyone who's uh, bi curious, <laughs> looking to, you can just you can just uh, send us <laughs> some mail. Uh, no. <laughs> Only bi curious though. If you are full on bisexual, get the fuck. <laughs> yeah, we're gonna have a talk later. So that's the show. Well, hey, if I mean, if we don't have a future, might as well have some fun, right? Have a great <laughs> week, everybody. <laughs> we will see you next week. Bye.